I would like to offer a very warm welcome to you who have joined us today for online worship from the First Presbyterian Church of Sterling and Myersville Presbyterian Church. Two Presbyterian churches worshiping together. I'm Pastor Stephanie Munsell, and I hope that this service of worship is helpful to you on your journey of faith. In October, we will continue to hold our in-person worship at 10 a.m. at the Myersville Presbyterian Church. Our mission of the month in October is Heifer International. It's a global non-for-profit dedicated to ending hunger and poverty while caring for the earth. Heifer encourages us to support their efforts by purchasing a portion of a gift of cows or goats or chickens or bees and even seeds. By giving these to people in need, nutritious milk and meat and eggs and food and fodder and so much more is given to communities living in hunger and poverty. If you would like to help feed the world in October, make a donation and mark your check or envelope with heifer. Please know that our bell choir practice has resumed. This takes place on Sunday afternoons after our service of worship. You are welcome to join us. For members of the First Presbyterian Church of Sterling, a meeting of the congregation is called for after worship on October 29th for the purpose of electing officers. And now, it is with joy and a deep need for peace that I invite us to worship God together. Please join me in the responsive call to worship by reading these words on your screen. Though there are rulers, presidents, kings, queens, God is the Lord of all life. In God we live and move and have our being. Though we are tempted to worship ourselves, wealth, power, and follow our own pride or fear, God is the Lord of all life. God, God expects our faithfulness and our service. Come, let us worship the Lord who is always with us. Let us praise God who walks daily by our side. God is the Lord of all life. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are our refuge. When the world gets to be too much with us, we turn to you for consolation and healing. Help us today to hear your words of compassion. Enable us to be those who would willingly serve all people in need. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
Join me now in our prayer of confession. O Lord, we are so easily pulled this way and that way by those who would promise instant solutions for all the world's woes. We want to have everything be happy, and we don't know what to do. And so we pay attention to the loudest voices, whether they are voices of blame or promise. In our fearfulness, we love to blame, place blame on the shoulders of a few people. In our anguish, we seek instant answers from unreliable sources. Lord, turn us around. Help us know that you are our Lord. You have given us abilities and understanding and ways in which we can be those who would bring peace and justice. Help us truly place our trust in you. Guide us so that we may show our faith in love and service. This prayer we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this good news. The Lord has given us gifts and abilities to work for peace and justice. Trust in God's presence and love. Celebrate as you have been forgiven and made new. Amen and Alleluia. Join me in prayer as we prepare for God's word. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Psalm 93. Listen for God's word. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded in strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house. O Lord, forevermore. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Listen for God's word. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? And they answered, The emperor's. And then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are of the emperor's, and to God the things of God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. And they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a story about 
an IRS agent, the in Internal Revenue Service agent, who made a call to a certain town's pastor. The call said Mr. Smith put on his tax return that he made a contribution of $5,000 to your church. Is that true? There was a brief pause on the other end of the line, and the pastor quietly responded, if he didn't, he sure will. In the text from Matthew 22, Jesus is confronted with a question concerning taxes. Taxes paid to the Roman Empire. In Jesus' day, the Jewish people in Galilee were under the political authority of Rome. They had to pay taxes to Caesar. Caesar claimed not only to be the earthly ruler of his empire, but also a divine one. Jews, of course, acknowledge only one God. So tributing, giving tribute to the emperor claiming to be God was problematic. So there were internal conflicts and theological complications to navigate for any Jewish person of the time who paid such a tax. This included Jesus and was complicated being asked about paying for taxes. There were even revolts by the Judean community protesting the paying of the taxes. So this was no intellectual or abstract debate about paying these taxes. Rome itself took very seriously anyone in the Jewish community who questioned being and paying the Roman tax. It was considered treasonous. So when Jesus was asked if he answered the question about the taxes, he could either give offense to the Pharisees and the Herodians and the many in the crowd who were upset with the emperor's constant meddling, not to mention the poor in the crowd and those who were listening, who was particularly burdened by paying taxes. On the other hand, if Jesus spoke out um, against the taxes, certain loyalists around him would report this to the powers that be. It was a trap. And the trap is laid first with this false flattery. And then the question is put to Jesus as a simple yes and no question. But Jesus is no fool. He sees the game being played and he sets his own trap. He asks that those who are asking the question produce the coin that is paid, used to pay this tax. And I can imagine the Pharisees sort of rummaging around in their cloaks and taking out the pouches that are tied to their waist and pulling out the coin, the coin. Thereby, Jesus exposes that the Pharisees are already acknowledging Caesar's authority. They are using his money. They have it in their possession, a coin that bears the image of the emperor, an inscription that is a statement calling Caesar God. Jesus exposes that this question is really insincere. Now, there's many ways to look at this text for lessons about our own lives today. Professor Brown of New Testament Studies at uh, a seminary so summarizes the lesson like this. At the core, the issues raised by this biblical passage are ones of allegiance. If God owns all, then we belong to God alone. Yet we live in a life which has competing powers and influences that vie to own us, to sway us, to capture our hearts. So says Professor Brown. Fidelity, allegiance, loyalty, these aren't necessarily terms that we use when we think of our relationship with God. Instead, we use the language of faithfulness to describe that we are committed to loving God, and to following God's will and ways in our own lives. For example, when someone joins our church, we ask them to make a public declaration of their faith, of their faithfulness to God. We ask them, who is your Lord and Savior? And the answer is that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. When we ask elders and deacons and pastors a similar question, when they are accepting their call, we ask, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledging him as Lord of all, head of the church, and through him, 
believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today, this story about Jesus' cleverness as he's dealing with these political factions both in his own community and in his, his surrounding community, we are given the question, who is the ruler of our hearts and conscience? The truth is that most humans have at their core either explicit or implicit sets of values that they live according to. And we Christians, we look to the person of Jesus as the revelation and articulation of God's values. But just as the question posed to Jesus was not just an abstract thought or a thought experiment, so too do the questions raised by this story to us who are faithful have real life meaning for us today. Jesus was tested with a question about the use of a coin. So let's start there as we look to find a lesson for our life today. One lesson is simply to consider how do we use our money in ways that reflect our commitment to Christ-like values? This could be a question of specifically what establishments we support with our hard-earned dollars. But I think more importantly than that kind of question of investing our money according to our faith values is about what we spend our money on more broadly. Sadly, if many Christians did an accounting of what we spend our money on, some of us would find that we spend more money on coffee or eating out than what we give to the church or to causes to end hunger and promote peace. Now this may feel like an early stewardship pitch, but money is just simply one of the most concrete ways that we can objectively show our values and our faithfulness to God. So yes, I hope that you do respond in faith by giving consistently and generously to the church, but also to causes that Jesus would champion today. But we could also get at the, at the core of this issue of our faithfulness to God by asking ourselves, how do we invest, for instance, our time? There are likely some people who have bumper stickers on their cars or tweet on their phones uh, superficially about their allegiance to Christ, but who spend more time gossiping or speaking negatively about others or scrolling on social media than they spend time in prayer, reading scripture, attending services, or serving the poor. It's a question of investment, of our faithfulness. Our second lesson is a similar vein. The account of Jesus and the coin can prompt us to think about what are our false gods? That's the second lesson. Now, we might not be faced with an emperor who claims to be God, but we are no less pressured and prone to being caught by false gods. There certainly are political figures in this world who could easily be called out for acting as if they want us to worship them like a deity. The good book reminds us we cannot serve two masters. In other words, a second lesson might be to ask ourselves, what rules in our lives? We can have all sorts of false gods, anything that takes the place of God as the most important focus and priority in our lives, can be idolatrous. For addicts, their drug of choice becomes their highest power in their life. That illness makes a person do anything and everything to feed their addiction. Their addiction owns them. But we don't need to be clinically ill to have our life ruled by unhealthy and unholy forces. Most people don't say, that their search for success is the most important thing in their life. But if we look, we can see that some people spend more time at work than they do with family and friends. Maybe the climb to the top isn't an idol ruling someone's life until when push comes to shove, we see someone willing to 
lie just a little to get ahead, or justify throwing a colleague under the bus to get a promotion. Maybe you do this for prestige. Someone else does it for power, for wealth. Then in our life is more in service to the bottom line or to getting ahead than to being a follower of Jesus. Wealth and power are two gods that lure many human hearts away from faithfulness to our just and compassionate creator. Now it's at this point that I would want us to look at the text about Jesus and how he navigates these questions to try to figure out what do we see in this story that helps us not to follow false gods, gods, that helps us not to invest in values that don't fit with our faithfulness. Now it's interesting to me that early in Matthew we can find a quote from Jesus saying to his disciples, Look, I'm sending you as sheep out among the wolves. Therefore, be wise as snakes and innocent as doves. There are forces which vie for our attention, which seek to redirect our moral compass, which shape the choices that we make, and they are seriously complex. We need to be as wise as Jesus. Christians need to be serious and critical thinkers looking deep within ourselves to weigh what is motivating us and guiding us, as well as looking outward with discernment to reflect on who and what is of God and what is not. Not every false God is stamped with gold. We need to be critical thinking, thinkers. And critical thinking doesn't mean being cynical or unkind. Seeking truthful information and thoughtful analysis and evaluation of issues that are complex is what we need to do to live as moral and compassionate followers of Christ, who was wise and wily. As you think about how Jesus navigated this trap, this question about taxes, what lessons do you take away? How might you do something different in the coming week ahead that suggests that you indeed follow Jesus Christ in your life, that he is Lord of your life. What does that look like for you? This is what Jesus asks of us as we contemplate scripture and find a way to follow with graceful and complete faithfulness as much as we can muster. May God bless us on our journey of faith. Alleluia. Amen. Our affirmation of faith comes to us from a brief statement of faith. Let us speak these words in faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick, binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to eternal life. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
And now let God's people pray together. Lord, we enter the gates with thanksgiving and praise. Many of us have come to this time of worship with burdens, seeking your healing. Others have come with joy, celebrating the goodness and blessings that abide. Each one is welcome in this time of prayer. We know that there is much work to be done in this world. Injustice, greed, isolation, alienation, and war all exist. Lord, we have forgotten how to be your people of peace. Help us now to accept the peace that you offer us and help us to commit ourselves to seeking peace. Help us to pray the names of people who are dear to us, seeking prayers for their needs. Let us also remember to be faithful and faithful in working for you in all that we do. Help us to give to you our complete faithfulness. Teach us to be good citizens of your kingdom here on earth. Be with us as we end this time of prayer and help us to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord show his face to you and have compassion on you. 
May God turn his face to you and give you peace. And the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always.